Join me in welcoming a real American hero, Louis Zamperini. such an amazing life. It's like you've lived four lifetimes. Louis, the student at USC, and you've got the hat there. Uh, Louis, the track star. Louis, the Olympic athlete. Louis, the World War II veteran. Louis, the survivor of a Japanese POW camp. Louis, the alcoholic. Louis, the Christian. What a life you've lived. All that you've gone through all the hardship that you have faced. Do you feel that that has prepared you for something later in life? Absolutely. Uh, I've had too many uh, near-death experiences to, to, to consider it, uh, an accident. I think God uh, saved me and prepared my life when I accepted Christ uh, further the gospel wherever I go. Yes. And, and, and we're doing it now through the book. Yeah, that's right, your new book which is right here. I don't know if you've all seen this book. It's called Unbroken. This is an absolutely amazing book. In fact, I read it, and after I was done, I thought, I've got to meet Louis Zamperini. <laughs> and so I was able to do that, and I'm so glad about that. So let's talk about your life a little bit. Louis, you, um, you went to school in Torrance, and you ran uh, for the team there, and you had a nickname as a runner. What was it? Well, they, they called me the Torrance Tornado. <laughs> the Torrance Tornado. And then uh, you did so well in your running that you eventually qualified to run in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany. And you, tell us a little bit about that event in Germany in the Olympics. Well, actually, when, when I made the team, now this, this is during the Depression when food was scarce. Yeah. So when I got aboard my first ship crossing the Atlantic to, to Hamburg, I couldn't believe the food they served you on a boat. Yeah. And I. Uh, I think I got my gold medal eating food crossing the Atlantic. Yeah, ate a lot of food. So you, and your roommate was Jesse Owens, was it not? Yeah, Jesse Owens and Mac Robinson. Right, so you arrive in the Olympics, you run in the race, you uh, do so well that you're asked to uh, have a moment to meet Adolf Hitler of all people. So tell us about that. Well, it was really my last lap. I was hopelessly behind. But my brother was a coach, and he's the one that uh, turned me uh, from a juvenile delinquent to an athlete. And he said, when that last lap comes, everybody's tired, but you think of it this way, isn't one minute of pain worth a lifetime of glory? Right. So I spent the whole last lap in 56 seconds, which they called a blistering last lap. And as a result, I was asked to meet Hitler. Uh, he said, Hitler wants to, want to meet you. So I shook hands with Hitler briefly, and all he said was, a boy with a fast finish. Yeah. Later on, you were adrift at sea. We'll get that in the moment. You punched a shark in the nose. You should have punched Hitler in the <laughs> nose, Louis. <laughs> well, he, he didn't. He didn't <laughs> Hitler didn't look that dangerous. He looked yeah. like a comedian. Yeah, you, uh, Louis said that Hitler looked like a comedian. It was almost a comical figure, but turned out to be such an evil man. But let's fast forward. So you're in the, you're in the military and you are in the Pacific Theater flying against the Japanese, and you're on an airplane called the Green Hornet. Uh, not the best airplane around, and what happened? Well, the Green Hornet was a B-24 bomber, and uh, we called it the Flying Coffin. And uh, we were out searching for a lost B-25 about 800 miles south of Hawaii, and uh, we had motor trouble. We were flying at a very low altitude, around 800 feet, and uh, a second motor went out, and the plane just uh, heeled over on its side, and at 45 degree angle, it plunged into the ocean, and there was a gigantic explosion. You later, you went down with that plane. How deep did you go? Well, I was, my job was to hold a life raft 
in front of me, behind the tripod of the machine gun mount. And then when the plane hit, I ducked down low, which forced me and the life raft under the tripod. So I'm painfully wedged into the tripod, and I can't move anything but my head. And then the tail snapped off, and all the control wires that go within an inch of the tripod, those coiled around me, so I'm now I'm doubly trapped in. There's no way I can get out. And uh, I'm thinking rapidly, and my ears popped, and I felt a, a sharp a pain in my forehead. And then, just before I lost consciousness, I knew I was dead. I just, all I could say was, God help me. And that was it. I, so I figured I'm dead. But I came, I, I, I came, uh, what do you want to call it, alive? Whatever. Uh, all I know is I'm freed, I'm loosened from the tripod, and I'm floating upwards in the plane, and I'm trying to find some way to get out of the plane. And as I flailed around my arms, my USC ring on the index finger caught onto the waist window. Now, it's impossible to let go because my body's buoyant and the plane's sinking, and the ring twisted on my finger and cut into the bone. And I couldn't let go, which was, thank God I couldn't. I pulled myself out of the ship, inflated my life jacket, and after swallowing blood, uh, oil and whatever, gasoline, I got to the surface, threw the blood up, threw everything up, and then I got a life raft. Uh, my two buddies were hanging out to a gas tank. Uh, the pilot's head was bleeding profusely, arterial blood. And so we got together and I stopped the bleeding, put on a tight compress, and we started our 47-day drift in the South Pacific. 47 days at sea on a life raft. Soon the sharks started circling around your raft. One night, a massive, was it a night or day when that massive, was it a 20-foot great white came by? Uh, absolutely, we got a good look at it. But at first we thought it, see, we, we were hit from below. We were sleeping. Yeah. And something hit us and lifted us in the air about two feet and bruised us. I thought it was the submarine coming to the surface. And when I finally looked over, I saw this great white, the only, the only one we saw in the entire Pacific. He probably 18 to 20 feet, and I could not believe the size of that creature. And he kept circling us, splashing water on us to see if we were, you know, food. And, but we kept so silent after about 10 minutes, he just took off, we never saw him again. But other sharks were getting aggressive. They were bumping up against and even starting to come in the raft. And so you decided to turn the tables, and instead of the sharks eating you, what did you do? Well, they tried to make us part of their food chain. Now, I know the experts say that we're not part of their food chain, but we were. And we decided to make them part of our food chain, so I was able to catch two smaller sharks, a, 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 a four-footer and a three-footer, and uh, we ate their liver, which is 20% of the shark is liver. And liver was used uh, almost primarily to make vitamin pills before World War II. Yeah. So it was a very nutritious meal. Yeah, it was. It was the best <laughs> meal we had. So here you are, 40, uh, 27 days at sea on your raft. Uh, a plane flies by. You think it's a friendly plane, an American plane. You start waving. What happened? Well, we were sure it was a B-25, and so we took our shirts off. We're waving at the plane. He comes down low and he passes us, we're waving at him. And then all of a sudden, two machine guns are opened up on us. And uh, now we're, we're together in a four foot by three foot space. And they strafed us. And they strafed us for about a half hour, around the clock. And uh, there were actually 48 holes in the space where we were sitting. Yet no one was touched by a bullet. It was just amazing. So they're firing from the air. You survived that. You make it to 47 days on your raft, and you're eventually captured by the Japanese, sent to a Japanese POW camp. They discover that you're the famous Olympic athlete, Louis Zamperini. They want you to go on radio and do propaganda for them. Uh, but you didn't want to do that, did you? No, American, American movie stars and athletes were famous in Japan. Uh, they had neither, and so they, they knew every athlete we had in America, and they knew that I was missing in action. They knew I was picked up by their own people. And, uh, and then we went, to, we were taken to Execution Island, which is Kwajalein, and they execute all prisoners there. And, and our date of execution was set. But another officer came in who followed sports, 
and he said it would ber better serve Japan's purpose to send Louis on to Japan to make radio broadcast, meaning and propaganda, which made sense. Sure. And so that's how we, our life was saved by this other officer. And I met him after the war, by the way. Oh, really? So you were in this camp. There was an especially cruel guard, uh, Mutashiro Watanabe, nicknamed the bird, that really focused on you and he would beat you and treat you cruelly. Tell us about the bird. Well, the bird, he, he always looked for me every day. When he could find me, I got punched out. And uh, it wasn't so much the pain. I could take the pain, but it was the stripping me of my dignity, and that hurt. And I used to stand there with my fist clenched, and he knew I wanted to hit him. And he kept saying, if I draw my sword, I must use it. But I didn't dare hit him, but I wanted to. And that built up inside of me. And that was the beginning of my post-traumatic stress. So World War II finally comes to an end. Uh, you are released from this camp. You come back to America a hero. At one point you were thought dead. Your death certificate was even signed by the president. But Louis Zamperini is alive. Everyone knows your story. But you, you have post-traumatic stress syndrome, which I don't even know if they knew what that was back then, was it? At that time they didn't know. Didn't know. Uh, but I was officially declared dead. Money was sent to my parents. $10,000, I come home alive, my parents saved the money, we sent it back to the insurance company, and they sent it back to us with the statement that uh, Captain Zapparini's death was no fault of his own, and so we got to keep the money. Yeah. <laughs> so, you spiral into drinking. Your life is filled with rage. You're having nightmares every night about Watanabe, the bird. One night, you wake up, you dream you're choking the bird, and you wake up and you're choking your wife. And excuse me, I forgot to say that you came home and married your beautiful wife, Cynthia Applewhite, and so now you're married, but you've descended into alcoholism, you're filled with rage, and you wanted to go back to Japan and kill the bird. Well, I felt it destroyed my life, and so I really didn't have much to live for, and I really, I tried to make enough money so I could go back there and secretly do him in. Right. But that didn't work out, fortunately. And so your alcoholism continues. Your wife decides she's going to divorce you. But she goes and hears a young preacher from North Carolina who is holding a meeting in Los Angeles. And that preacher's name, of course, was Billy Graham. And your wife commits her life to Christ. And then she says to you, because I'm a Christian now, I'm not going to divorce you, but I want you to come hear the evangelist. And you didn't want to go, did you? No. No, absolutely not. And just probably like some of the people here tonight <laughs> didn't want to come here either. But uh, so you heard Billy Graham. You did go. And you heard Billy Graham. And you left the first time you heard him, didn't the you? The first night, yeah, when he was talking about being a sinner, I thought, well, he doesn't have to tell me that. I know that already. Right. And uh, so I left. Uh, I was mad. But then my wife reminded me of the fact that she it was in the process of divorcing, but she would not divorce me because of her conversion. Right. And that convinced me to go back the second time. And again, I started to leave, and Billy Graham said something like, uh, when people come to the end of their rope, and there's no wills to turn, they turn to God. And I thought, that's what happened on the raft. I turned to God. In prison camp, I turned to God, get me home alive, and I'll seek you and serve you. I came home alive. He kept his promise. I didn't keep mine. I felt terribly guilty about that. I went back to the prayer room and made a confession of my faith in Christ, and I just could not believe Amen. the change. That's right. So, so you remember the prayer. You prayed on that raft. You asked for God's help. But now God has helped you. He saved you. He's, he's kept you alive. You go and give your life to Jesus Christ. Louis Zamperini is now a Christian. You wanted to kill the bird, but something's changed in your heart. Now you want to go meet the bird and do what? Well, I wanted to go tell him that I forgave him. Uh, I, was, uh, I explained to him about Christianity, how it changed my life in a moment. Uh, I know that five people, four people gave the book a five-star rating. One guy gave it a four-star rating. He said, why didn't you give it a five-star rating? He said, because I cannot understand how a man can get over 
post-traumatic stress in a moment. Well, the moment was when I received Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new person. That's right. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. That's right. So, it's true. So, Louis, you, when you went back to Japan, you, you shared the gospel with some of the very guards that mistreated you, and you wanted to meet the bird, but you were told the bird was dead. He wasn't, but you didn't know that at the no, time. But you wrote him a letter. Do you have that letter with you? I, I, yeah, I brought it with me. This is the letter that Louis wrote to the bird. You want me to read it? Yo, would you okay. read it, please? <laughs> okay. This is to Matsushiro Watanabe. As a result of my prisoner of war experience under your unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. I, it was not so much due to the pain and suffering as it was to the tension of stress and humiliation that caused me to hate with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights not only as a prisoner but also as a human being were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain enough dignity and hope to live under the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble, but thanks to a confrontation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ. Love replaced the hate I had for you, and Christ even said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and was graciously allowed to address all the Japanese war criminals at Tsugamo Prison. I asked them about you and was told that you probably had committed harakiri, which I was sad to hear. At that moment, like the others, I also forgave you, and now I would hope that you would also become a Christian. Amen. That's a uh, forgiveness. That's great. So, Louis, maybe there's somebody here tonight, like a young Louis Zamperini. They don't even want to be here. Uh, they're going to hear a sermon like you heard years ago there in L.A. What would you say to them? Why should they believe in Jesus Christ? Because He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life for salvation. And, uh, <laughs> and He did say that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. And that, that provides salvation for our soul. And uh, if you want to uh, renew your life in Jesus Christ, then of course uh, you, you, you must make that all important decision and open your heart door and invite Christ in. Thank you very much. Let's thank Louis Zamperini for coming here tonight. God bless you, Louis. God bless you.